Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Romain Michon, and uh, I'm a research faculty at INRIA in France and a lecturer at uh, Karma Stanford University. And I'm going to talk about high-level programming of FPGAs for real-time audio signal processing applications. So uh, uh, we're going to be more on the embedded side of things and... Uh, uh, I don't know, maybe like some of uh, things that were presented in the previous talk could work for this. Anyway, so this is the presentation outline. Uh, first, I'm going to tell you what an FPGA is, because I'm sure that some people in the room uh, probably don't know. Uh, I'll show you how FPGAs can be used for real-time audio signal processing. I will talk about our system, which allows people to program FPGAs at a very high level for audio processing applications. And finally, I will talk about potential applications, performances, and uh, research avenue. So what is an FPGA? So usually in the field of audio, the type of processors that we use are uh, have a fixed architecture. So people are going to use DSPs, people are going to use uh, are going to use CPUs, people are going to use uh, uh, microcontrollers, and uh, all these systems have a fixed architecture. Uh, unlike uh, these kind of processors, FPGAs have uh, an architecture uh, that can be modified to serve a specific purpose. So basically. An FPGA can be seen as a make-your-own-processor kind of system. So uh, basically, uh, the way FPGAs are programs are using what we call a hardware description language. So you can't really program FPGAs with uh, traditional programming languages like C, C++, or whatever. You have to use a programming language which basically describes an electronic circuit, uh, which is why FPGAs are considered more as hardware than software. Uh, in some respects. So uh, the resources that you have on FPGAs are a set of programmable logic blocks, uh, and, uh, and basically the way you program your FPGAs by uh, connecting them uh, together. Uh, so the performances of FPGAs are limited by two different things. Basically, it's usually the amount of resources that you have available on the chip. So basically, the number of logic gates, the number of block RAMs, or things like this. So, so it's really like the, the physical uh, resources that are available in the FPGA that uh, matter. And a little bit like other kind of architectures, uh, the maximum clock at which FPGAs can be run is also uh, important. Uh, so as many of you probably know, FPGAs are known for their high level of parallelization, uh, which means that potentially you can gain uh, significant uh, performances, uh, figures, uh, if you have an algorithm which can be heavily parallelized. And uh, that's due to the fact that because you can make your own processor, uh, you can decide to have uh, as many uh, cores as you want, basically, you know, and, uh, and that's, uh, that's why you get a very high level of parallelization. The two main manufacturers of FPGAs are uh, Xilinx, which was recently acquired by AMD, and Altera, which was uh, less recently acquired by Intel, but there are others. Those are like the two main uh, manufacturers. So uh, how can we use FPGAs for real-time audio signal processing? So uh, the first thing that I want to say is that FPGAs offer really unique features in the context of uh, real-time audio DSP. So first, you can do sample-per-sample -sample computation, uh, which can be very useful, especially if you want to have low latency uh, performances. Uh, you can... Uh, target super, super high sampling rates uh, in the megahertz range. Uh, you can go like far above 20 megahertz if you want, so, uh, so potentially that can be interesting. Uh, you get very low latency because of the sample per sample computing. You have a lot of GPIOs, which means that uh, if you want to interface your FPGA with uh, hardware, uh, especially if you want to do like say multi-channel, uh, FPGAs can be uh, very interesting. Uh, they're very well adapted uh, for audio DSP algorithms, which present a high level of parallelization, like spatial audio, model synthesis, uh, and we're all talking about real-time here, right? So I uh, so just want to emphasize this. 
uh, FPGAs are already used at the heart of some high-end professional audio products, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples of that. So, so uh, typically, you're going to find FPGAs in a lot of Dente audio interfaces because you need to actually uh, treat a lot of uh, parallel audio uh, streams uh, together, basically. And because FPGAs can really deal with a lot of parallel processing, you're going to find FPGAs a lot uh, in uh, Dente uh, audio products, basically. So, uh, so in that very specific case, the resources of PGAs uh, are used mostly to deal with parallel uh, processing of audio. Uh, another kind of products where you're going to find FPGAs are uh, some uh, uh, analog or digital analog uh, synthesizers uh, where basically you want to have a very high audio sampling rate. And uh, in that way, you can uh, potentially get rid of more aliasing if you're doing virtual analog or things like this. So, uh, so that's the case of the Novation Summit uh, keyboard, uh, which has an FPGA to run uh, some oscillators at 24 megahertz uh, in uh, terms of audio rate. Uh, another kind of products you're going to find are products where people use FPGAs to do uh, like heavy computing uh, for audio processing. So, uh, so here you sort of take more advantage of the, the performances uh, afforded by FPGAs, so like the computing performances. And that's the case of the uh, Antelope uh, Audio Synergy Core series. So uh, if the FPGAs are so great, uh, why don't we see more of them, uh, both in the industry and also in, uh, in academia in general? Well, the answer is very simple, and it's because basically they're very, 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 very hard to program. And, uh, and also, if you are not used to deal with low-level problems, uh, then uh, FPGAs are definitely not for, uh, for you. Okay, so uh, so usually when you deal with uh, FPGA systems, this is kind of the the architecture you're going to have for uh, audio-based uh, systems. So usually on an FPGA, you always have a CPU as well, and they communicate. Uh, they share a DDR, which is usually uh, outside of the FPGA, and so uh, there is always like this sort of loop between those three uh, elements, basically. So uh, so you want to do some computation on a, on the CPU. Uh, but anything that needs to have very low uh, latency or super high performances, usually you want to run that on the uh, FPGA. Uh, and then you can control the system using sensors or uh, GUI, and, uh, and that usually goes through the CPU. And then, uh, and then you have an audio codec for uh, retrieving uh, audio inputs and producing audio outputs. Right? So, so this is kind of the basic architecture of how most uh, of these products uh, actually uh, work. So why is it so challenging to program with PGAs for uh, audio applications? So uh, the first one is you have to deal with interfacing the CPU and the FPGA, which happens at a very, very, very low level, and, uh, and so, uh, so that's annoying. Uh, another uh, thing that's hard to do is interfacing DDR with the CPU and the FPGA, which also happens at a very, very low level. Uh, you know, you can't really just uh, allocate memory and use it. You know, like you actually have to access memory by hand directly in DDR, which uh, which is potentially uh, hard. Uh, balancing computation between the CPU and the FPGA can also be a lot of work. Like what goes on the CPU, what goes on the FPGA. Um, and uh, yeah, all of those uh, things imply uh, potentially important design decisions on what goes where, you know. And uh, and so uh, so it's definitely more complicated than uh, regular architectures. Uh, interfacing the FPGA with audio codec chips uh, can be hard too. Dealing with clocking issues because that's really uh, at this level that you're working. Dealing with hardware description languages like Verilog or VHDL uh, and implying the use of fixed point arithmetic. Uh, you can't really do floating points on this system, so uh, it means that if you want to do audio processing, you have to do it the, the old way, and, uh, and that can also be uh, pretty rough. Uh, thinking programs as a hardware cir circuit instead of software is also uh, another issue. Because you know? usually, if you're a software engineer and you're trying to program an FPGA, well, then uh, it's going to be pretty tough for you uh, because of that. Anyway. So this is an example of an FPGA board uh, that we've used for uh, this project. 
And, uh, and so what we propose people to do is to use Faust to uh, actually program FPGAs. So briefly, what is Faust? Faust is a functional program language for real-time audio signal processing. So, uh, so it's, uh, it's a DSL, domain-specific language. It's been developed for the past 20 years. Uh, and uh, Faust allows us to generate C, C++, Java, LLVM, WebAssembly, Rust, and many more uh, types of programming languages. And so uh, you can go from Faust to any of these uh, languages and potentially uh, program an FPGA with it. The Faust compiler provides a high level of control on the generated code, so, uh, so we, we really master that aspect a lot. And one of Faust's strengths is that it has uh, hundreds of DSP objects which are pre-implemented and, and that are completely uh, open source thanks to Judius, for example, in particular, you know, like who really contributed a lot to this. Faust is completely open source. Um, so uh, how do we use uh, Faust with FPGA? So, uh, so we developed this thing called the CFLA toolchain, which is also completely open source and that you can potentially use for this. Uh, and it basically allows you to program FPGA platforms using uh, Faust. Uh, CFALA relies heavily on this technology, which is called high-level synthesis, uh, which is uh, provided by uh, Xilinx, and uh, which allows you to uh, deal with FPGA at a slightly higher level than uh, uh, you wouldn't normally do if you were using hardware description languages. So here is what kind of happens. You go from Faust, you generate C++. It's very specific kind of C++ that is really specifically designed to work with HLS. Uh, and, uh, and then you do high-level synthesis and finally you generate uh, an intellectual property because that's how uh, uh, compiled objects are called in the world of FPGAs, which is kind of funny, right? Uh, so a specific Faust backend was created for this, and uh, Faust really takes care of balancing uh, computing between the CPU, the FPGA, and deciding on what goes into DDR and what doesn't go in DDR and just remains on the FPGA. Uh, CIFL already supports a lot of uh, audio codecs, uh, which are all audio codecs that are kind of uh, aiming for low latency. So, uh, so this is the case of the analog devices, ADU 1777, uh, 1787. So those audio codecs are specifically uh, designed to have a very good uh, audio latency. Uh, so a series of open source modular sister boards have been designed for this, and, uh, and finally the CIFLA toolchain can be optionally used now with Linux. So it means that uh, uh, you can actually use this as a hardware accelerator, so, uh, so you can run Linux on the CPU and process all your audio DSP on the FPGA, and, uh, and the CIFLA toolchain is compatible uh, with this. Anyway, so this is an example of a sister board that we implemented as part of this in the team, you know, and, uh, and so they basically just go on top of the FPGA and, uh, and uh, this is more like a side project. So yeah, briefly I want to talk about the performances, uh, applications, and research avenues for uh, this. So uh, the first thing is ultra-low latency. So, uh, so the main reason for doing ultra-low latency is potentially to be able to do uh, active control. So basically, what you do with noise cancelling headphones can potentially be uh, exported to the size of a room, you know, and to do this, uh, you potentially need very low uh, latency. And so, uh, so this is one of the things that we're targeting. So uh, the system that we have now uh, runs uh, with this figure, so you can have 11 microseconds of round-trip latency uh, for like analog to analog, basically, if you run the whole system at 768 kilohertz, so you need specific audio codecs for this, obviously. Um, so uh, potentially, uh, you can get a lot of uh, audio inputs, a lot of audio outputs using this. So, uh, so this is good for uh, spatial audio with these latency uh, figures, which is also uh, important. Uh, and uh, most applications for this are targeting towards uh, active control, basically. And uh, yeah. so uh, we have a, currently a project, like a research project around this, which is called the FAST project. And, uh, and 
the, it's between multiple institutions and the whole goal of this project is to develop this platform and also uh, use it in the context of active control of room uh, acoustics. So, uh, so we're currently developing things like this, where uh, it's like big sister boards for FPGAs, uh, where you get a lot of audio inputs and a lot of audio outputs, but uh, with latency as low as uh, 11 microseconds for round trip latency, right? So, uh, so, so this is what we're uh, currently doing. Um, another project that we have is around uh, ultra high audio sampling rates. So, uh, so basically, this is a project that we do with Victor Lazzarini and Joe Timoni and Minuth University in Ireland. And uh, and the whole idea behind this uh, is to basically be able to do audio uh, at uh, more than 25 megahertz uh, in terms of audio sampling rates, uh, which opens the doors for uh, lowering. Uh, aliasing or, uh, you know, like uh, doing all sorts of things uh, in terms of the way you approach uh, audio DSP. And currently, we have a fifth order Sigma Delta uh, DAC running on the FPGA. Uh, and so it means that, uh, like, this is already kind of uh, working. Sorry, I'm going a little bit faster because I think I was a little bit ambitious in terms of the number of slides that I prepared, as you can tell. Uh, so we have another project around multi-channel where we try to uh, use a feature GAs to basically do WFS, and uh, and this is also all based on uh, the Cephala toolchain. So uh, so here we have an example of a WFS system, which uh, basically costs very little money because it's based on those uh, I squared S amplifiers that are all controlled by the FPGA. So uh, so basically you can do very very cheap WFS using this kind of uh, system. So this is kind of an overview of what we have. So 11 microseconds latency. Uh, we uh, could probably uh, lower this uh, if we managed to get a sigma delta ADC uh, implemented directly in the FPGA. And uh, also, we can get a lot of audio inputs and audio outputs uh, out of the system. Uh, OK, I'm going to skip this for now because I want to take questions. And I will just say thank you to all of you. And I just want to say one more thing before I stop talking. Uh, there is going to be a Karma Summer workshop on this topic, and uh, we are still taking registrations. So, uh, so if you're free at this time, it's a five days workshop uh, back in Palo Alto, and it's going to be taught by Maxim Popov and Pierre Koshar. Thank you very much. Are you familiar with System C, uh, the programming language that was an attempt merger between VHDL and C++? And can you comment about it? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. So, um, I mean, I think HLS really replaced, like, the, like I think uh, if you go to uh, Xilinx or if you go to Intel, I feel like HLS is really like the kind of tool that they are trying to promote to do this kind of uh, this kind of things, you know. And uh, and so, uh, but yeah, no, we we know of this, but uh, I don't know if it's still like super super active, you know. And uh, and clearly, like for uh, high level uh, programming of FPGAs, I think that HLS is kind of the go tool tool that people are using nowadays. So, uh, but yeah. So I've only known FPGAs from kind of in the past, like large chips. Like how small do some of these chips get? Uh, you mean like physically? The physical or? size, yeah. Oh, they're as small as uh, like a microcontroller or as a CPU. Like if you basically uh, go back to uh, this picture, like I mean the, the physical footprint is very, very low. You know, like this is... I mean, you see like the size of the, the jack connector here, you know, like that's the FPGA here, you know, and, uh, and that's the heat sink for the FPGA, you know, like so, so they're actually fairly small, you know, and, uh, and this FPGA is like a rather large one, you know, like you, you can have like FPGAs that are like as small as like the tip of your finger, you know, so they're, they're actually very uh, small. What is the uh, is is there any hope of M1 Max uh, support or Max support overall? I'm looking at the page for the upcoming. Oh, yeah. that is a good question. Uh, 
probably no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's not really our fault. Uh, it's mostly Xinix's fault, basically. You know, because uh, tr for some reason, traditionally, people in the FPGA world use more Windows than uh, than the Mac. You know, and uh, and so uh, so much of their tool chain only works on uh, Linux or uh, Windows, basically. And so uh, I think they never really thought about this. <laughs> and uh, since uh, it's very hard to deal with Windows for this kind of stuff, you know, like Linux is just the way to go. But uh, yeah, good, uh, good question. 